Hello, friends. Uh, it is great to be with you on another Friday here in Lent. Mm -hmm. We are um, we're really excited that we are at a, a kind of crucial moment here for um, Cana 90, for Lent. Um, this really it's is... like a transition time, this you is know, a, this is a between big... the Lenten season and the Easter season. That's right. And, and so for, for us as Catholics, this is a, a time of uh, great challenge. So as we've gone through this journey together on uh, Cana 90, we are coming into a very, very sacred and holy time, the holiest time. Yeah. Really of the year. And we were actually talking about this beforehand that we, um, for the past two years, we've done a webinar on the Triduum and celebrating the Triduum with your family it's and just to give deal. ideas and like talk about that. And we didn't do that this year. So this is kind of we'll, like we'll, that webinar. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll try to pack it in here. Yeah. And so if you have questions about things that you would like, you're like, how do we, how do you celebrate Holy Thursday or what's some ideas or, and we're going to throw out some ideas, but maybe you have ideas or maybe something we're saying is not clear. So please go ahead and just like send us those questions um, while we're talking. But what we're going to do now is we're going to be going through um, the three days of the Triduum, um, first starting with first Palm Sunday, and then the three days of the Triduum, and just talk about some ideas for how to uh, how to celebrate with your family effectively, which and is it, really it's so important. And as we've done before, we'll have our, our little meditation uh, first, and then at the end, we'll respond to questions that have been sent in. Um, and if you have more, right. you can add them. The um, random as questions well. that are sent in. That's right. Yeah. So stay on if you want to listen, if you want to find out about how to celebrate the Triduum with your kids. So this is, hey, it's, if they're big kids, you can just take them all to services. But if there's little kids, sometimes you have to do things a little bit differently. Well, I, we do, I like doing things in our home, you know, yeah. uh, e even with the older kids mm -hmm. too. So uh, why don't we start? Okay. So obviously this Sunday is Palm Sunday. So this is the procession of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And he knows, he is the only one, really, maybe the Blessed Mother too, who knew what he was walking into. He knew that his passion was in front of him. Nobody else really knew. And this was him coming in, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so in your home, it's a really good idea to think about does, do my children know what we're entering into? Do they recognize that Palm Sunday is the beginning of the holiest week of the year, of the week upon which really the rest of the liturgical week, the blah, liturgical year really um, focuses on and follows? So really, this is a great time for you and your spouse to think about how are we going to celebrate the Triduum? I mean, we're instantly reminded, right? You and you walk into Palm Sunday, everybody has the palms. It's the stuff. This isn't a normal Sunday, yeah. right? They get things to hit each other with and <laughs> to mess around with in the view, which can be a little frustrating. But putting that aside, um, we are instantly reminded that this is different. This is different. So think about how are you going to make that different at your home as well? Because it's not enough to just do these things at church, to just celebrate the Triduum at church, you really need to do it at home as well. And so you need to do something at home to make it different also. Yeah, and, and that's really what we want to spend some time talking about. We'll break down each of the days, but but the Triduum, right? So it's those three days. So we have gone, we're, we're still in Lent. This is the last Friday, I guess, technically, kind of, yeah. in Lent. Um, and then we're going to come to Palm Sunday or Passion Triduum. Sunday. And then we're going to go into those three days where kind of see this is one big celebration in some ways, but it's Holy Thursday, Good Friday um, into the Easter vigil. And um, and so the Triduum, we want to make this real in your home. And one of the things that we try to do is, is set this week aside, as you said, starting on, on Palm Sunday, but to really create a prayer space in your home. Right. And, and for little guys, that might be a little prayer garden where they actually can kind of, we have some ideas in the Canaan 90 book of how to do that. Or, or maybe it's setting up, if you haven't ever considered this before, a prayer altar uh, in mm -hmm. your home. You know, there's nothing that will ever replace um, going to Mass. That, right? Experiencing the Eucharist, you know, and, and I felt like we felt that pain as we had lockdowns uh, mm -hmm. during COVID. Um, but in your home, what does that look like as a prayer space? So your kids can say, hey, we have some candles set aside. Maybe right. maybe if you have a kneeler or maybe it's just that there's images uh, or maybe you, you do. Um, we know some families who drape 
a cloth over any other sacred images uh, to kind of just remind mm-hmm. us that there is a veil being brought over, uh, that there's something different that's going on. And you can even make, like, I know that you can look up ideas for making a, um, like, a tomb. Like, if you yeah. use a can or something and then you pile oh. rocks and things around, you can right. actually build something yourself. Even if you don't necessarily even need a little picture of Jesus or a figure of Jesus, even if you just have the tomb itself and the garden and you make a cross. But those kinds of things are these visual reminders that this week is different. One thing actually I was just thinking when you were talking was about um, doing the Liturgy of the Hours. Consider, especially maybe not if you have kids like younger, like under 10, but maybe you and your spouse or you and your older children saying the Liturgy of the Hours every day this week. Do it morning prayer and evening prayer, maybe night prayer. do that every day to really kind of emphasize where, you know, this is, these days are not the same. And we're going to begin our day differently and we're going to end our day differently. And, and our job as parents um, in general, but, but very specifically here, is to take the, um, uh, the spiritual and make it real, right. in, incarnational, right? I mean, and that's in theory, things that we're teaching them, that's other thing, you know, but in this way, we're supposed to take the, this special time and how do we bring it to life um, mm-hmm. in our home? And that begins... Yeah, so let's talk about Holy Thursday. So this is the opening of the Triduum, right? And this is when we celebrate the Eucharist and the priesthood. Those are the two focuses of um, Holy Thursday, the Holy Thursday Mass. Now, one thing that we have done every year since I was a child um, is something called a Seder meal. And so this is a, a similar to a Passover meal that they celebrated in the Jewish um, tradition, but a Seder meal is also something that we can, um, we have Seder. Christianized. Yeah. So we have to do a Christian Seder meal that really reminds us of the traditions of our Jewish brothers and sisters, which and it, I think and is it points to, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. And it, <laughs> and it points to the mass. So we can see in the Jewish Seder meal, the liturgy of the word, and you can see the breaking of the bread and you can see the sharing of intentions and you can see like the passing of things around the communal meal. And it's a really beautiful tradition. I mean, sometimes, some years we've done it on Palm Sunday. Some years we've done it on um, Wednesday because I would, I do music a lot. So I would do music for Holy Thursday. Um, but some years we did do it on Holy Thursday. And, and, it's, and it's a great way, I feel like, to open the Triduum because like we put out our best china. There are special like little jars of, jars of water. There are special foods. Like it's a very specific ritual that we do in our home. And it really opens up that time of the Triduum for us. And it's a real honoring of the Lord and his saving action and really gets the children thinking about the Last Supper and about what happened at that time. And in the version of the Seder meal that we use, all throughout, there's explanation and there's pointing to the Gospels and there's pointing to traditions, the Jewish tradition, and then pointing to the Gospels. So it's really a great way for to get to, for the kids to experience. Too. Yeah, it's teaching by doing, right? right. It's not just by sitting there and talking to the kids, but it's like, okay, let's do this. And it's a really fun way, um, fun, I shouldn't say fun is the wrong word, an interesting way, an interactive way um, for children to enter into this time. And again, what we're trying to offer is ideas of how to make this alive in your family. Yeah. And then, you know, after Holy Thursday, we move to Good Friday. Right. And Good Friday is obviously a much more somber day. You know, this is celebrating our Lord's passion and death on the cross. And, um, you know, as the church has asked us for a day of fasting. And again, even even with those who don't, your children, depending on the age, they don't have to fast according to the church. They, they might be younger and exempt. Maybe it's just a very simple foods for that day, right. you know, and, um, you know, soups or, or, or bread. Now for adults, it would be great to have a, a possibly a bread and water, just that there, there is something within us that we're, we're um, making as a sacrifice, trying to unite ourselves right. in some small way with the sacrifice of Christ. But think about the hours between 12 and three as maybe times of silence, you know, where he hung on that cross uh, for us. Maybe in the home, there's no media going on at that time. Right. Uh, we love to go to the stations on, on, uh, on every Friday in Lent, but then uh, particularly on that day, we try to find an outdoor stations that we mm-hmm. can do. And it's just, uh, you know, walking along and walking along with uh, Jesus. Right. Um, but then we have the services, the Good Friday services that are in parishes. And if you can go to church, Wonderful. Go to church. It's wonderful to be together as a family for, um, meaning a, a family of God, right? As, as a, as a church, family. as a parish family. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
but it's also if you are um, struggling with the little kids on a Good Friday, <laughs> which probably go, is, is that a, is that a, a redundancy? Yes. <laughs> uh, little kids and struggle, but um, you can have that almost that entire service at home, right? Outside of usually you receive communion. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no mass celebrated on Good Friday, but you can oftentimes at this Good Friday service receive communion. Um, but this is a great way. You're venerating a cross. We've done that in our homes. We you know, have the readings, the general intercessions, you know, all the prayers that happen, you know, minus you go into communion so you can make a spiritual communion to that. And you really have something that, that your family is able to experience maybe on the age appropriate level, depending on your kids. We did that for many years because I just felt like the Good Friday service was just way too long and it was at a difficult time for naps and everything. And so just don't do nothing, you know, make sure that you do something. And we would just do like an abbreviated version of the reading of the Passion and the veneration of the cross. Little kids love that. They They love going up and kissing the cross, kissing the crucifix. Do some kind of procession, do intercessions. Like there's so much that you can do um, at home. And then that just prepares them the following year to actually participate in the Good Friday services because you can say this is just like we would do at home. And so really make that a tradition within your home to do something like that on Good Friday. So then we have Holy Saturday. So Holy Saturday is kind of like, yes, this is like the woods between the worlds, you know, (laughs) like it's just like the quiet time. So this is obviously Jesus is in the tomb, right? And so there is a reflection in your Canaan 90 book, and you'll get this in your email as well. Um, It's something for you to read to your children. It's from the Liturgy of the Hours too. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So again, if you're continuing to pray the Liturgy of the Hours during this time, you'll read it in there. This is the day for us that we do Easter eggs. This is when we dye our Easter eggs. This is when we have just a family day. We kind of treat it almost like a like we would a Sunday. It's a family day. It's a day to just be a together bit, a and to bit relax. Somber, though. Yeah, yeah, and and prepare for Easter and maybe get, you know, get the house ready, get all of those things ready. So it's not really a celebration. It's more it's like a day of preparation. <laughs> and um and and really to kind of like bring joy even to that time. Sometime we would do an outing, like go to a zoo or, you know, go to a museum or something like that as we're in this time of waiting for the Feast of the Resurrection. And this is my favorite time, right? So so one, it, it's the highest feast of the year for us um, as Catholics. But um, a tradition that we have done and really would encourage you to think about is having an Easter fire. You know, again, I go into greater detail in Canaan 90 um, on what that could look like. Uh, but the idea that our kids are attracted to the smells and the bells, that the, the physical stuff really is a powerful tool. But I think there's almost no more powerful tool uh, in our arsenal than a fire, you know, than a, a moment where we can set ablaze something in the darkness. Now, so ideally, um, you, you know, the church often does this at the Easter vigil, right? And um, maybe for you, the Easter vigil will be good and you maybe do a little reading or a little bit of songs and you have a fire and you know so forth. Or uh, what I've modified it to is getting up really early on Easter morning. And so we have kids who get up early anyway, so I make them get up earlier so it's in the dark, <laughs> right? And the it's key a is in different. the dark, right? And, and they, they, have, they know that there's only a certain age that they get to kind of graduate to come out and join mm-hmm. dad at, at the fire, right? And so we do, in the dark, we read uh, some of the, a couple of the Old Testament readings that are pointing forward uh, prophetically to Jesus' coming. Um, and then we read some Psalms. You know, again, you can do it shorter, smaller, no problem. Depending on the kids. But mm-hmm. then we begin to light the fire while it's still dark out, right? And that um, then as the, as the sun is coming up, you've already illuminated the dark. And it's just like, this is the dawn. This is the new day. This is the rising. Uh, this is the power of the resurrection, that they see it visibly. And we start singing songs. Now, you can mar- rate, roast marshmallows. We've tried roasting peeps, you know, from our <laughs> Easter. And whatever it might be, but to, to celebrate, <laughs> to tell some stories, though. Again, as my kids have gotten older... I, first, I told them little stories about St. Patrick and lighting the fire. Yeah. And then it, we also have gone into some, uh, you know, ideas of sending off uh, or, or kind of sharing some of the story, stories of saints um, or friends in our lives, kind of testimonies of faith, stories of heroes 
that we want them to see that this is why we're here. And they're very, very attentive. They're very, their heart is very open. And it's kind of like supple, uh, looking yeah. for something. Because there's just something powerful about being in darkness and then light dawning on you. And don't let anything deter you. If it's raining, who cares? He's Do it anyway. It. He's yeah. done it so many times yeah. in the rain or in drizzle. But, you know, when that fire gets started, it really warms you up. And it makes it, it, makes it possible. <laughs> and then whether you do that or I mean, I, I think you should do it. I don't know why you're not going to do it, but but <laughs> but, but it, it, it's so much fun. But but even if you don't do that, think about the day. You know, you went to mass on on Easter Sunday. Maybe there's another time where you could just pray as a family, sing some songs together. You know, mm-hmm. do something that's different. Make your home different. Maybe you have a special playlist of some great Christian songs that have the word we haven't been saying liturgically right. throughout all of Lent. You know, whatever it might be. But just maybe really that's how that- you wake up with everybody in the morning and you have, plan a special breakfast. You know, and you do some kind of celebration and do the Easter egg hunt, you know, yeah. give them their Easter baskets or hide their Easter baskets and make them do a treasure hunt for it. Or, you know, just, it's just, there's so many things that we can do with our children to celebrate. And if there is any day that you want them to remember, it should be Easter Sunday. Your kids should look at Easter and say, Easter is just as fun as Christmas. And if it's not, that is your responsibility. Yeah. So you have to do that. Do whatever you have to take and it, whatever you have to do. And it usually involves gifts and candy. I mean, let's be honest. Hey, right? but, but, you know, we want to give them a taste of heaven, right? That's yeah. what it, it, our job is to help make, again, that, that spiritual reality into a tangible good right. that they are attaching. We are Catholic after all. Let's you know? do it. And, right? <laughs> and, and, and again, all of these ideas are so you can make your own um internal traditions, family yeah. traditions that celebrate this time. Um, but we've been pointing forward throughout all of Lent to this celebration. Let's mm-hmm. make this a huge home run, both tangibly, mm-hmm. uh, materially, as well as, as spiritually for our families. And just a note, for those of you who are doing Canaan 90, or even if you're not, this would be a great time to jump in to receive those daily emails because for the 50 days after Easter, we are gonna be taking every week to focus on a different aspect of family culture. So you can be looking at your family and building up who you are as your identity and kind of building up that belonging and mission within your own home. And there's the resources in Canaan 90 to do that, which all culminates at Pentecost. So if you haven't done Canaan 90 or you're wondering what is that, go to our website and sign up because there are 50 days, well, 57 days really, because we have this week and then plus the whole um, Easter season. So please sign up and do that and renew your family culture during the Easter season. All right, so let's go to some of the questions that were sent in. Yeah. And if you have any questions on, um, we love talking about how to incorporate kids more into the celebration. So if you have any questions on yeah. uh, celebrating uh, Passion Sunday, the Triduum. Hello uh, to all of you joining. Please go ahead, feel free to chat any questions you may have for us. We love just kind of doing things on the fly. So, um, but we have some questions that were sent in ahead of time. All right. Um, how, do you, how do you approach godparents that are friends but don't acknowledge that they are your child's godparents or they don't really attempt to connect uh, during the year or they or as they approach your kids first communion right so so they're kind of ghosting they're yeah. like ghosting, they're ghosting you their, and your their, children their godchild right <laughs> yes exactly so so first um, admission here we are godparents and we haven't always done a great job so right. any of our godchildren we're sorry we haven't done more okay <laughs> i i there are um, Some but, of our godchildren have logged on to here when we're on them, right. yes, in the past. Um, but but, uh, but sometimes godparents need reminders. That's right, and, and reminders are never a problem. But also, it, it, think about first, just take ownership for yourself. You can't control other people, but you can control yourself. So if you are a godparent, maybe think about that. You know, right. some ideas uh, are really reaching out on their baptismal day every year. You know, uh, there's a whole book about godparenting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that some great ideas. We've done subscriptions to things like Magnificat. Mm-hmm. Um, there's We've been mailed other... them books. We've mailed them religious books. Yeah. Like and so I th- we feel like our job as a godparent is to be not present as a parent, but but in those special moments. And we do think the First Communion, you know, kind of all the sacraments that they celebrate, that there's something that we're doing. But what should they do? Right. So, um, so here's the tricky part. If you chose godparents that weren't engaged, whose fault is that? <laughs> or who's that? Who's got right. the challenge there? I mean, it would be great if we could ma- wave a wand and that people would do what you wanted them to do. Right. It's kind of this pesky thing like free will, right? Yeah. That, that, that comes in there. So what do you do with friends? 
So you, mm-hmm. you admit that they're friends. That's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So they're still friends. Are, are they? And because we've also heard from people in the past, and I, they didn't say this in this question, but they're just saying they're not engaged, basically in their. God I would just club. give them a reminder and then just let it go. You got It's not worth it. Yeah. You know, it, it's. I don't think anybody was nagged into being a good spouse, um, a good husband. Or a good godparent. Like, no, that just doesn't work that way. So I think you can remind them and then just let it go. And if you're looking for mentors for your children, maybe it's just seek elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Invitation, reminder is great. Oh, it's right. great. We had to listen to Messy Family Podcast in our Christian marriage class. Awesome. Yes. Great professor. Yes, I'm assuming that's William Newton. <laughs> We love him. He's a good friend. <laughs> and uh, so glad. Yes. You're okay. Joining us. So, have, how have you managed work with little ones? Mother's helper, daycare. Thank you. Okay. So, there's just a reality that a lot of women um, work. A lot of women work from home, and I think that that is a really important thing that women bring their giftedness to the world. And so, how have you managed? I've done everything. Like I've tried, I've tried lots and lots of different things. So I'm going to be like, yes, yes. Um, the one thing that I would say to though, is that one thing to be aware of is to always acknowledge that your children are only little ones. Okay. You can work the rest of your life, literally the rest of your life. Like you can work until you die. (laughs) I mean, and some people do, some people work forever, but your child will only be two once. They will only be three once. They will only be five once. And if you manage to keep your peace and have your emotional reserves available for your children um, and you can work, then do it. But as soon as you find that your work is disabling, and I don't mean once, I mean like on a regular basis, okay? Like you see a pattern that your work is not um, feeding you, your work is draining you. And that when you come home from work or you're, when you're finished working, you feel like you have nothing left to give your family. That's a boom, boom, boom. <laughs> like, a, you know, red light should be going on and you and your spouse should have a really serious talk about that. So maybe it's working less. Maybe it's changing a job. Maybe it's not working at all because nothing can replace you in the lives of your children. So, and mother's helper can't replace you. Mother's helper is there to fold the laundry and to clean your house and to maybe even you know hold a baby for a little bit. But for the most part, you're the one that needs to engage with your children. You're the one that needs to form them because nobody can give a toddler formation. Nobody can love your infant the way that you can. And you kind of have to, you have to find that balance. Because like I said, I, I women have great gifts to give to the world. I've always worked. I've always worked in some capacity through having, raising our 10 children. But I have to be, we have to be very, very careful that it fits into my main vocation of being a wife and mother. And that looks it looks different and, even from month to month. And there are challenges and there are opportunities and there are unique situations that everybody has to discern that themselves. Exactly. So the first key thing, you know, again, the question was about how do you manage little ones? We, If you have a bunch of them, you do need some help. Let's just be honest about that. And you as a spouse. Even if you're not working. If you're not working. Because <laughs> you know, it didn't say they were working or anything, yeah. right? So so we we have loved having people who help out and, and come and be a part of this. And I think that's a great ministry from a parish, particularly when there's a new child born, that there's some help for that mom mm-hmm. particularly. Um, but if there's ways that the mom can be at home with the kids, bonus. Yeah. Yeah. If, the, if that if there's challenges in, in balancing work and, and home life balance, again, whether it's the husband's at home, because we've seen more of that uh, these days too, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, whoever's there, there is something beautiful about the two of you as a couple deciding what's going to work for our kids right now where we are. Yes. This child has needs and yes. they have wants. And how do we get that done? How do yeah. we make that work? And sometimes it really is a year to year discernment. Okay. And that's why you have two parents. That's why you have the two of you. All right. So here's a question. And I think I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll answer it in some ways here. Uh, best way to make marriage <laughs> life, uh, marriage, um, a priority. Five kids under seven. So babysitter, family is not possible. So the, the first thing that I want to say is that there was a question mark at the best way to make marriage a priority. Now that's a statement. The best way to make marriage a priority is making it a priority, right? So we It's not we, an option. Yeah. We have to make sure that when our kids, the first thing, that the most, I mean, obviously we need food, clothing, and shelter. We have some human needs for every child. And a child needs to be loved and cared for. But the number one thing you can do for your child is prioritize this relationship. Mm-hmm. That this marriage 
is this stabilizing force. Every social science study That's talks right. about this over and over again. Non-Christian, not religious in any way. Looking at this relationship and that stability is what a child needs to thrive. More than anything else. Academically, yeah. um, it, spiritually, mm -hmm. financially. All these reasons that your marriage needs to be placed as a priority. So although you're saying, how do you do this? I guess that's the real question. You, you just, you do it. Like, <laughs> um, I know, it's like, I, I, I don't want to tell you kind of like, suck it up. But there's a part of me that does really want to say that. <laughs> because it's like. But we get it. We, we know it's a challenge. We're not saying that I, it's hey, easy. I, we, I've had five kids under seven. You know, I get it. I have been there. And I'm just telling you, do not say that babysitter is not a priority. Do not say that. Do so not, do not say that. You got to find the right one. Right. And then, and there are times where you're, you're having a date night in. Right, we've done that um, plenty and, of times, and, and that's not a problem. The, the 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 question isn't where you're going or how much money you're spending, um, but it's it's how it's working. So, uh, first thing is, is if you got a lot of little kids and you don't want to, and again, that's a, that's a personal decision. You don't want to get a babysitter or don't have comfort level with that, but you still need your kids in bed at a time where you can have time together. Yeah, and so you, you got to make that work. So, mm -hmm. so you've got to be super creative. And again, we we have a ton of resources about how to make that work. But you need to say. This is a non-negotiable in our marriage from this point going forward that we are going to have regular date nights as a couple. How do we make that happen? we got to get super creative about. Right. Um, it, you know, there were times where we actually had to wake up earlier than our kids mm -hmm. to have a little check-in. It wasn't an intense time, but every day where we had some time together just to talk, process what's going on. You know, a lot have. of couples that do that, they will take a baby gate, they put it in front of their child's door. Your ch you are not allowed out of this room until seven o'clock or whatever time they say. And then parents get up at six o'clock and they make sure that they have that time. If you have five kids under seven, literally the most important practical thing you can do, sleep schedule. Have a specific time when your kids are allowed out of the rooms in the morning and a specific time that they go to bed. Because if you have all of your kids in bed by eight o'clock, you can get a babysitter because your babysitter is not going to have to do anything with the kids. You have your babysitter come at 8.15, 8, 8.30. You and your husband go out to a bar and play pool, you know, for three hours. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding you. Like, you need to do that. You need to make that time to do it. And, and I'm not saying that you have to have somebody come and take care of your all five kids all day. Get your kids to bed at a, at a reasonable amount of time. And then you can even, like Mike said, yeah. he would put kids to bed and I would be downstairs and I would like set up dinner yeah, yeah. and... You know, like set up a movie and everything like in our living room and we would just do a, a date night in. And so there's lots of different ways you do. And also those kids, five kids won't be under seven forever. Yeah. They won't. But you also cannot wait two years and be like, oh, sorry, honey. We're not going to spend any time alone together for the next three years because we have five kids under seven. Like that's, it's not, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and I, I'd love to challenge anybody listening or watching the recording to put comments in of how you have made that a priority. How yeah. have you figured it out? Because you're not alone. We we do get that. It, it is a struggle, but you got to start with the mind shift of saying, we've got to do this. Yeah. This is this is for the life of our marriage and it's for the good of our children. We need to prioritize our marriage. So and how the, can we do it is the question. Of the thousands of couples that we've dealt with, if you want to make it happen, you make it happen. That's right. So don't say it's not possible. It's definitely possible. We'll make it. Yeah. Work. All right. Um, kids over the age of reason still acting out at mass. What do we do? You know, frustrated in Fresno. What do you say? <laughs> Okay, well, there's a couple things that we do. Actually, our next podcast that we're going to do, I think at the beginning of May, um, is we're going to talk about oh, kids, kids at mass. mass. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's on our docket to, to do again. So make Sorry, sure you I listen in. So so subscribe to the podcast and then you'll know. Uh, sure, go ahead. Well, it's, so the first I mean, I have is, ideas, but I'm I know you know. do. I appreciate <laughs> you. Um, but, but the first idea here is that um, when kids are acting out, right, at mass or anywhere, you, you you have to train them, right? I mean, that's our job I, as parents is to help train our kids. They don't um, come out of the womb knowing how to act in mass. That's okay. Like, and, and, that's what you're supposed to be and doing. And that's part of the whole <laughs> idea of boundaries, right? Absolutely. We, we create yeah. boundaries so that we can help train them in the way that they should go. Right. right? They they have some goodness within them, but they also got a concupiscence that's going the wrong direction, right? Absolutely. And our job is to help raise them up in that virtue. So first is just a, a, a recognition that because it's at mass doesn't change the fact that it's still our job to form and train and lead them. Um, so recognizing that, how do you do that if they're acting out at home? 
How are they treated? Now, uh, the worst thing is, and I, I have to admit this, that we'll be driving to church and I'm yelling at the kids before I get to mass. <laughs> Not a good idea for me or them, right? right. But um, uh, saying that in, 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 in the ideal situation, you are able to help train them in such a way that when they are at mass, they are... Uh, they so you start are, by training when, them at home. Yeah, so you've got to start by giving them regular training at home. So if they're acting out, if it's one kid, like, figure out what's happening here. Is it, a, is it a whole gang of them that are all going off? Or is there one kid going off the rails first? Sit down with them. Walk them through it. Mm -hmm. Don't assume they know. Don't You don't have to yell. You don't have to lose your cool. Mm -hmm. no. This is not about that. If it becomes about that, which it has for me at times from yelling at them on the way to church... Um, and I don't do that really much anymore. <laughs> um, but, but it, 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 it's me losing my cool. So if I can take it out of the situation, cause no one wants to yell at them at church. If you can address it. Before you can address it before the situation, train them in that set expectations and then have consequences. Right. right. And right. I think our kids in every situation always need reminders. Absolutely. Gentle reminders. I need reminders. Right. And yeah. so it's okay. So they're kids. They're still growing. B give them some flexibility. Give them some, you know, they're not going to have a, the standard that you may want. Um, don't lose the standard that you want for them just because they don't perform to it. But don't, yeah. also don't say they're going to reach it tomorrow either. You know what I was thinking? It's like, um, do you get distracted at mass? Because I do. And it's just that we're adults. And so we know to sit there. Little, little kids are, are bad liars in the sense that, they're distracted. You're just going to know it because you're going to see right. that they're not, they start in, they're not covering it up like you or I do. <laughs> so just kind of, first of all, have a little bit of compassion and mercy and just knowing that, yeah, we all get okay. distracted during mass and, and that's okay. It's just that they start like, you know, falling over on the pew and, you know, whatever, staring at the ceiling and bothering the brother if they're, uh, if they're bored. So what they have to do is just kind of like learn that self-control. One thing that I always do probably up until like Claire, our youngest is nine. And I just recently stopped doing this. And I just bring a little pad, a, a little like notebook, like about this big and a pencil and just give it to them. And so really probably four years old and up, they can, they would just sit there and just draw Quietly and just draw, draw and write. And they would, sometimes they would like draw the stained glass windows. Sometimes I would have kids open up things and copy words out of the missile. That's all fine. That's all fine. And I would just allow them to do that up until the Eucharistic prayer. Then I take it away and then they just, and then and then during the Eucharistic prayer, I would usually just hold them. You know, I would put my arms around them. Even a seven-year-old, even if they're over the age of reason, they're seven, eight years old, you can still put your arms around them, hold them, talk to them, say, there's Jesus. Say, I love you, Jesus. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Like teach them how to pray. Teach them those things as you're sitting there with them. And don't be afraid to give consequences. We have teenagers who are talking or to their friends during mass, I have 100% separated teenagers during mass, okay. even from their friends. If we bring their friends and they're talking too much, and if oh, they're yeah. embarrassed, too bad. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not like going to yell at them. I'm just going to move them. I'm just going to move them and sit in between them. And, and, and again, it's like, on teenagers, sorry. again, uh, we're assuming that they're above the age of reason, but still below teens. But So there's different levels uh, that we go with. But if you think about it this way, if that, you know, kind of going with the training thing that I said earlier outside of mass is if your only time that you're praying silently or expecting That's them right. to sit silently so and true. pray is at once one hour a week on Sunday, well, why are you surprised, right? Yeah. So we as parents you need, need to, to look at it and say, we're going to pray. And, and keep it brief at home, but you're building up, again, a, a muscle memory in them that they can do that later. Okay, I think and it's we got 6 more. o'clock. we got to wrap it up. Yeah. So anyway, but we, we have more for you in the future. But uh, thank you again for, yes. for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, it is it is awesome to see um, all of you here. And uh, for those who are watching us on um, the recording, um, this is uh, this is this is going to be our second to last. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll, we'll announce when we're going to do it on Good Friday because that's going to. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll announce that here when we'll do it live. We will. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. So, we'll but again, thanks for coming. Uh, really celebrate uh, Palm Sunday this weekend and most especially the Tritum, uh, Triduum as we come into it uh, for the future. Okay. All right. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.